Roberto. I, I was lucky enough many years ago in 1960 to be able to work in Italian films for 15 years or so as an actor and later as a writer and assistant director and somewhat sometimes a director. And it began with a fluke almost of an agent from Italy, a woman agent who was assistant agent to an agency there, visiting in Hollywood, went to the Italian uh, and foreign uh, department head of Paramount, and somehow he mentioned that, oh, there are we have a young Peter Baldwin. He used to like to travel a lot. Well, it was the Navy. That's why I traveled a lot. They told me to travel. And after a couple of false starts, she's got an uh, offer for a job from uh, an Italian company with a, a war film being directed by Roberto Rossellini, the famous Roberto Rossellini, one of the founders of the neorealistic movement in Italy, which meant no money. I remember De Sica telling me that, uh, who I met and worked with later, that uh, to get the camera started, oftentimes now the famous, most, one of the two most famous Italian directors of photography, Giuseppe Rotuno, his job was to kick the camera to get it going. And Roberto's first film, he wanted a dolly shot, but they didn't have money to put the rails down, which they used those days, but not even the uh, movioli dolly, which has wheels like rubber wheels. They had rails and these things would, they, they would fix on the rails, even curved rails, but Roberto didn't have money for that, so he sat in a baby carriage and was pushed and held the camera in his hand. And so the neorealism was really, and oftentimes non-actors. Federico Fellini used to direct by, cast his films by photographs. He'd get photographs of different actors and he would put them on the wall and study them. And oh, I think that guy would fit in with this part and that part. In Italy, they'd, they'd take recordings, direct recordings of uh, the dialogue as it's being spoken but they just use that as a click track to know where they are in the scene. And the acting comes in later when they put, dub the voices in, because everything would be dubbed no matter what language we speak as actors, it comes out in Italian on the screen. Anyway, in January of 1960, I got this job for uh, three million lira, which was $5,000, but it was plenty. And they you know, would, would uh, pay for my trip over and, and occasionally a meal. In January we started, and uh, I walked in and met Roberto Rossellini in, in the offices at Cinecitta, and he said, uh, we're welcome, and I want you to read the script, and then come back tomorrow and tell me about, you know, what you think of the script. The script was, was enormous, that thick, because they have a different style. They don't write the description, and then a little space, and then the dialogue indented, and then another. They have all the dialogue on one side, all sound on one side, all the visual description on another, and they never overlap. They may overlap in fact, but they print it that way, so the script was enormous. And so I came back the next day, and I said, yeah, it's interesting, it was about three soldiers, an American, an Englishman, and a Scotsman. Only he had met an actor in uh, Venice, Sergei Vanderchuk, who was a Russian director-actor, and he said, we've already got an Englishman, we don't need him. So they bumped him, and not at the person, but at the character, and inserted a Russian. So we had a Russian, an Englishman, and an American flyer. That was me. And we were being helped by different strata of Italian society, the black marketeers, the partisans, the noble people, the clergy, and as we, as we were being secreted around in Rome. The title of the film was Era Notte a Roma, which is It Was Night in Rome. Translated in, a, in, a, in a, it never came to America, but translated in for the festivals as Night Over Rome. It was about the last days before the arrival of the American troops into Rome. So I, I told him uh, I, I, the script was fine, at which point he said, Okay, you read the script, right? Okay. He threw it in the, in the wastebasket. Crash. So we just want you to know the, somewhat of the story. We'll write the script and write the dialogue as we go, day by day. Then getting to his style of shooting. And I said, oh, uh, Mr. Rossellini, Roberto, Roberto, I should have said maestro, maybe we would have kept that. Anyway, Roberto, I had, if you, in the test that, that they sent that, that you guys decided on me, I, I had my hair blonde. Would, would, that, uh, would you want it that way or what? 
what color is your hair? Is it like that? Is it brown? I said, yeah, well, that's fine. That's good. That's neorealism. Why, why not use your own hair? Why you fake it? So on January 12th, we started. I, I had been wounded in the story, so I was kind of being helped. And uh, Sergei and Leo Gen was the Englishman, who was an Eng a well-known actor who was nominated, if not uh, received, an Oscar for Snake Pit. Remember that movie, The Snake Pit with uh, Olivia de Havilland? Anyway. I was being helped and we were going out of a cave and being given to the black marketeers from the partisans and, and it was it, all action, very little dialogue. I don't think there was any dialogue as a matter of fact. And so we started on January 12th and then we laid off right away, did one day work. We said, well, what's that? Why shouldn't we be shooting? And Roberto said, no, the January 12th was the day I started my first film, it was my lucky day, so I start all films on January 12th. We'll start in a week or so now and we get further along. And so we did that. And so um, he had had trouble in that first film, even though it started on January 12th. He talked about it as a film. He, he, he was being financed by a uh, prince. Who knows if he was a real prince or not, but he had the money and he kept referring to it in his desk drawer, right down here, right in this desk drawer. And in Italy, the government premiums and any kind of uh, 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 subsidies they might get from the government for filmmaking always came with the first turn of the handle. That's what they called it. In the old days, they used to grind the cameras. That first turn of the handle, it means the first take, then the money kicks in. So the prince was saying, well, when, when, when that first day comes, we're going to do it, right? Then you'll have my money right there. And then the, the thing is, they opened the drawer. There was nothing there. The prince was cuckoo, and it was... You know, Roberto had to scramble to get his financing. But that was not on our film. Our film was financed by a grocer from Genoa who felt that he wouldn't let that film go to America until he got all his money back, which wasn't a whole lot, but it was enough to finance the film. And so that was one of the bugaboos about not releasing it in America because he never got his money back from, from the Italian release. But here's a typical day. We come to work at noon. And we, uh, because Roberto likes to work better in the afternoon and evening. So we come at noon. We uh, meet on the set with our costumes on. And he describes how we're going to do the scene. Or maybe we don't even have our costumes on. It's partly. We're probably still talking about our costumes. And he says, okay, this scene, the, they're going to go out. And you're going to be alone in the, in the room. And then we'll... Uh, then we'll have them come back in the scene. Okay, that's, how, that's the scene. Okay, they'll talk about what they're going to do, and then you'll, you'll be left behind because you're wounded. And that's it. Let's go to eat. Let's go lunch. We hadn't done anything yet, but that's okay. We knew what the scene was going to be. At lunch, he would write the dialogue, and it would be translated into various languages, Russian for Sergei, English for Leo, myself, and that was it. Those are the, there were other, other people who were in it were famous. German actor Hannes Mesmer was in it. Paolo Stoppa, very famous actors, but Mesmer may have gotten it translated, but he, he knew Italian pretty well. Anyway, the translations came from someone who had learned English in 1906, maybe, and, and probably gone to theater in 1906 because they were using words like alas, hark, alack was another one. So Leo and I would say, we'll fix up the English, and in the meantime, we'll fix it up so we're a little more heroic, probably, right? So. Uh, we would do the dialogue, he'd say this, but instead of saying, what are we going to do? I'd say, what do you think we should do? You know, things like that, so as to make us all a little more heroic. But when we came back to work, now Carlini, the uh, director of photography, had lit the set pretty much from the way Roberto described the scene to him. And then we started to work. And we started to rehearse the scene as Roberto had staged it. We'd ask a little this, a little that, okay. And, now, you have to understand, this was 1960. The Zoomar lens, which we, which we live with now, the zoom lens, even in television, was only the telecameras were like that. But any film was done with basic fixed lenses. If you want a close-up, you put a 100 millimeter on it. You want a wide shot, you put a 35, which is what the eyes are, supposedly. Anyway, uh, the Pansonor lens was the French version, the first version of the zoom lens, and it had a remote 
servo motor on it. So you could follow the do the focus changes on a little motor here while the acting is going on over there and the cameras are shooting it. You're looking at this little motor and following it. At that point, it should be that close, and at this point, that close. And so Roberto staged these scenes so that we could do long takes moving in and out of close up, and then he'd have the thing this way, and then we'd go over that way, and he'd, the camera would follow us, and someone else would take the camera that way. It was all very well staged, because his theory was this, with the money that the grocer gave him. If I get two and a half minutes, so you shoot enough film to get two and a half minutes per day, I go 70 days, I've got a film. That's all he wanted. He wanted to make just the right amount. So he loved this Pansanor, and he'd say, at the end of a take, he'd say, I got it. How did it go? Everyone happy? You know, he heard it, and he might look up once in a while when there's a, someone of a fixed position, but he liked to do this stuff, and it was great. So it, it opened it up for us to do a lot of improvisation, and uh, it was a very, very happy set. We enjoyed it. Uh, the reason he had lunch right away is because his wife at the time was uh, Sanle Dasgupta, an Indian lady who was very conscious of his health and his size and his overweight and uh, would restrict his diet and feed him healthy vegetables and things like that. And then he'd come to work and he'd have his buddy Mandarino, who was a grip, which is the guys who handle the, uh, the uh, mechanical part of, of, a of a film set, he would cook for him. Or Mandarino would put spices that would curl your hair, you know. Spe oh, speaking of curling hair. Someone tipped us off. A guy said, if he, Roberto gets silent, he's very jolly and it was very jocular and easy to talk with and stuff, but if he gets kind of silent, watch for this. If he starts to curl the back of his hair like this, and if he started to curl his hair, it meant, uh-oh, he's mad about something. Here's trouble. Make sure you stay out of range, right? And uh, they told the story about, he, you know, he came, he saw, he conquered Ingrid Bergman, who actually wanted to go work with him, and they became uh, uh, lovers and, and mates and had children together. And she acted with him in several films. And they were what's called, in Italy they call white telephone films, which are uh, drawing room comedies or drawing room dramas where the phone is white because they're rich people and things like that. Anyway, they worked together on one of these films, and here's the description of why Roberto would start to go like this, because he couldn't take it, because he was neorealistic. You come in, if, if you've got groceries in your hand, you put them down on the counter. If you've got keys in your hand, you put them down as you pass the table. The phone is ringing, you go and answer it. And so he'd say, okay, darling, <laughs> here you come in here, you've got the groceries, you set them down on the counter, you get the phone, the ringing, you put the keys down. Where do I put the keys? On the table. Put them on the table as you're crossing the phone. That'll give you some action as you're going to get to the telephone. Where on the table? On the top of the table. He's starting, here we're starting to get this now a little bit. And she says, but I mean, what part of the table, top of the table? The first part you come to. Maybe that'd be good. You put the keys in the first part. You know, there's nothing reason to, to worry about what else is on the table. You mean that corner, the first corner of the table. Yes, yes, the first corner of the table. You put the keys down. Mm -hmm. The point of the scene was on the telephone, but he couldn't get her there. And he was gracious and he loved her, but so he was nice. So what he would do is, he would say, I have to take a pause before we shoot this. And he would get on a motorcycle and just go. Maybe for 15 minutes, maybe for less, maybe for more. But he would just drive and get it out of his system and come back, my darling. Then you come in, you put the keys on the corner of the table, the near corner of the table, and the groceries. Which, which grocery goes which bag goes which? Both go together wherever you want them. No, I'll tell you what. Put that one there and this one here. Then you go to the telephone. And he was very gracious in the thing. But they didn't work well together. So when we saw him going like this for some reason, we hoped it was someone else he was mad at. But anyway, in the scene that I described where they went out and left me alone in the room, there was an attic, and there was stuff in the attic like cans and not, not practical things, bed, head, headboards of beds and that stuff, but like a regular attic. And there was a cello there. And I did a little teeny research and found out that the movie Sergeant York with Gary Cooper was shot in, uh, in a, which I think he may have got the Academy Award, was shot early 
in the, or either 40 or early 40s. It was about World War I. And Sergeant York was an American hero, a conscientious objector who they refused to let be a conscientious objector and we came out and became a great hero. He was a marksman from Kentucky or Tennessee. He licked the bead on the end of the rifle, squirrel rifle or something, you know. And he, and he would make a sound like, gobble, 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 gobble. and the turkey would put his head up and pew, and at 200 yards or something, he put his eye out. And it was a very famous and one, wonderful movie. So I realized I had to do something in this room. So I said to Roberto, I said, I, I have an impulse in the last time rehearsal to, to kind of do something. He said, well, do it, do it. So anyway, I did this thing. I took the cello and I turned it into a rifle. And, and we had, oh, I forgot to say, we had a turkey that the Russian had captured and we we're gonna do it for Thanksgiving, right? They have a Thanksgiving feast with this turkey. So I pretended with the rifle. So that was my ad lib stuff. And Roberto said, that's fine, that's good. I'm glad we did that. I'll give you something, give us something curious. I mean, they didn't know, or maybe they did know Sergeant York, but the, it, was, it was something that he allowed. It was a great freedom. And yet, for instance, there was a scene where the Russian, we're all leaving and gonna go to somewhere else. And the Russian got shot at this point, uh, out in the street. There's a Russian custom that if you're leaving to transfer to another part of the world, another part of the country, you're gonna leave your homestead and go to somewhere else. Before you go, you sit down, you get everyone to sit down. And they just sit and look at each other for a second. They don't, if they're, even if they're rushing to the door, they hold it for a second, everyone sits down. And it was very moving to deal with him. In my mind, I knew the next, what's gonna happen in the street outside, he's gonna get shot. And the other guy and I escaped, but it was fun though to have that ability to improvise, but, and, and not so much improvise with each other in interaction, but just what your character might do. So anyway, he had his ways. If he's sitting next to you and he starts to talk to you and ask you questions about you and yourself, and it's like the sun is beaming on you. And then someone calls him to the other side of the room and he goes, uh, what? Well, I'll be right there. And it's like phew, a wall comes down. Not that he's mean to you, but it's like he's forgotten you. You're on, he's on to the next subject. He's a wonderful guy. Everyone loved him. He kept his families together. All the children that he had, he seemed to gather together. And at the end, when I, after that film, and I've been doing some other films, and one of them is with his stepdaughter, Pia Lindstrom, who was Ingrid's eldest child, with the, the Swedish doctor. Uh, I, we, they pick you up and take you in cars in, in Italy. You don't drive to the set yourself. And so we would drop her off and, and there would be Roberto at the door welcoming the last of his children with all the rest of them around his legs. You know, the little in Indian girl who was so gorgeous you couldn't stand it. She was about four or five years old. And then his sons. And uh, he, he, he just had this great family feeling. He was wonderful. And I, I certainly had a great, great, great entry into Italian films, acting in films with Roberto Rossellini. <laughs>